Chapter 1. Pay attention. Every bush is burning. Pay attention. Jesus. Brace yourself. This book is set to revolutionize your understanding of evangelism. Revolution, from the Latin revolvere, means a fundamental change. This revolution stands to shake the very roots of your faith, rattle the range of your mission, and roll the very limits of your freedom. Wait a minute, you say. There's a lot about me in that paragraph. I thought evangelism is about reaching out to others. Remember, a fundamental change. I think evangelism changes me as much as anybody. A friar returned to his monastery after an Ignatian 30-day retreat. Over granola the next morning, he was interrogated by a grumpy old member of the community who complained, We've been working like slaves while you've been swanning around doing nothing. And look at you. You don't look any different. You're quite right. I probably don't, was the reply. But you do. Jesus' last words in the Gospel of Luke are these. Go out and proclaim repentance and the forgiveness of sins. But a biblical understanding of repentance is not red-faced anger at other people's sins, but red-faced embarrassment at my own brokenness and the complicity of the evils and injustices of the world. Proclaiming repentance is as much about reminding me of my waywardness as it is about setting other people straight. When I am engaging with people of other religious faiths, I find myself unable to commit to their conclusions or agree with their assessments. Yet at the same time, I come away encouraged by the spiritual truths found in their traditions, thrilled by new insights into my own faith, and more passionate than ever about being a disciple of Jesus. The truth is illuminated and elongated in my mind, and my presuppositions and myopic perspectives are challenged and corrected in the process. Anything less would not be a conversation and would imply that the truth is a proposition and not Christ. Archbishop of Canterbury Rowan Williams said, To be a real agent of God, to connect with the neighbor, each of us needs to know the truth about himself or herself. I believe the lifeblood of evangelism is not propositions, but prepositions. For God to do something through us, God must be doing something in us. If we are not always evangelizing ourselves, we have no business evangelizing others. In fact, it is usually as God's grace courses through us to someone else that we become aware of God's love in and for us. Evangelism is an invitation for broken people together to meet the Christ who loves broken people. We all are damaged, but loved, crushed, but cherished with a divine embrace. When love is the motivation for evangelism, nudging is love in action, and the cracks in our broken vases are where Jesus leaks out first. Evangelism Jesus Style I define evangelism as nudge and evangelists as nudgers. Evangelism is awakening each other to the God who is already there. Evangelism is nudging people to pay attention to the mission of God in their lives and to the necessity of responding to that initiative in ways that birth new realities and the new birth. God only asks that we do what we do best, which is nudge. God takes it from there. The nudging act the human contact, the meeting of eyes, the sharing of space, the entanglement of words, the sense of bodily interaction, is to the soul what blood is to the body. Without nudging, the body cannot reproduce. Every person who crosses your threshold today is ripe for nudging. A nudge happens in proximity. Even the nudges across the internet or by phone take place in a proximity of relationships. The integrity of a nudge requires that it be welcomed and that it be reciprocal. The purpose of a nudge is to manifest Christ in a moment of mutual knowing, which benefits both the person being nudged and the nudger. Nudging is not best driven by fear or by some need within the nudger. Nudges are not contrived, but are the natural consequence of being with someone in a moment and wishing them to join you in recognizing a God moment. The best nudges culminate in a grunt of mutual recognition. 
God nudges me because God likes me. I nudge others because I like them. There is an implied caring that comes with nudging. So there you have it. Nudge. Gently pushing people off their seats, more than it is sitting people down or driving them to their knees. Nudging is more about sowing than reaping. To be clear, nudging encompasses the full range of gardening, from dropping a tiny seed into the ground, to loosening the dirt, watering, weeding, fertilizing, protecting from predators, picking the fruit, and even helping, in Jesus' words, the birds of the air nest under its shade. But every encounter is aimed not to bring in the sheaves. Nudging aims to bring people less to a decision than an impression, not just to an hour of decision, but a lifetime impression of God's presence and the nearness of God's kingdom. In fact, isn't this the essence of sanctified living? To make our whole life a un oui vivant, a living yes to the living Christ. This is exactly the opposite of ignoring the need for a decision. Rather, it is respecting and reverencing the process, if one looks back on it, by which each of us came to that place of decision. When an impression leads to a decision, it's hallelujah time. But the ultimate answer to that question, who do you say that I am, is best forthcoming from another question, what's up? Or when translated theologically, What's the I am up to in your life? We find the living one in the midst of living.